Hey there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. The Savvy Painter Podcast is published every other week on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, and Google Play. If you are a painter who is looking for down-to-earth, real-life conversations about art, how to create it, and how to sell it, you are in the right place. Savvy Painter has been downloaded over a million and a half times by artists in 150 countries. This is the place where you will find your community. You'll be inspired to create and you'll hear real stories from artists who are thriving with their art. So if you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you to the Savvy Painter community. But make sure that you don't miss an episode. Sign up for weekly updates, free guides, and workshop announcements. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It's that easy. My guest this week is Ilana Hagler. Ilana was born in Tel Aviv, Israel, and immigrated to the U.S. at the age of five. She currently lives in Alabama, where she's an assistant professor of art at Alabama State University and writes for the wonderful art blog, Painting Perceptions, which I hope you are familiar with. Ilana got her Bachelor of Arts in both studio art and psychology from Brandeis University in Boston. She continued her study in Italy where, as she puts it, she stumbled her way into a program with the great painter Leonard Anderson. In this interview, Ilana talks about that meeting and how his lessons continue to influence her today. And while in Italy, Ilana also met Israel Hirschberg, who she then studied with at the Jerusalem Studio School in Israel. That's my connection to Ilana. I met her and her husband Ari just a few years ago at the JSS summer program in Civita Castellana. Ilana and I talk about her painting, her process. She tells a hilarious story about how she got a teaching position with the Academy of Art in San Francisco. We also talk about the difficult period of almost exile after she graduated from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art, and how the simple routine of driving out to draw and paint with the artist Jordan Wolfson helped her through a difficult transition. Ilana has some great advice for you and is just an absolute joy to talk with. We touch on a lot more in this conversation, but let's hear it from Ilana. Ilana, welcome to the Savvy Painter Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Hi, Antrice, and thank you. It's an honor to be here. Tell me a little bit about when you started painting. I would love to hear sort of your origin story of what made you decide to pursue art as your vocation. Origin story. You're making me feel like an X-Men. That's pretty cool. Well, I always, always loved uh, drawing. It was a little while before I encountered painting, but I was always sneaking off somewhere to draw by myself. But when I was a little kid, maybe around five or so, it was generally decided within my family that I was going to be a doctor. I come from a medical family. And so art really wasn't an option. You know, I'm an immigrant myself. And there was this idea that, you know, you have to have a serious job to survive. You know, it's not a game. So when I got into high school, I completely stopped making art, which was quite a cut for me because as a younger child, I was just constantly, constantly drawing. And uh, when I got into college, it was Brandeis University. I didn't choose it because of art. I chose it because it had an excellent program in neuroscience. And uh, at the end of every single semester, I would come home. And I would tell my family, I don't think this is for me. This isn't making me happy. I I don't feel fulfilled. And, you know, as an immigrant family would be, what is this fulfilled nonsense? (laughs) Who said you get to be fulfilled? (laughs) Exactly. It was very much, what do you know about being a doctor? It's only been one semester. It's only been two semesters. It's only been three semesters. It's only been half of undergrad. (laughs) <laughs> and at that point, I realized that if I wanted things to change, I, I better change them now or I might find myself, you know, 15 years further on the road, you know, having, I'm sure, a very good profession that would help a lot of people, but would leave me um, unfulfilled. Right. So when I was 20, that's uh, when I made that big change. Wow. So, OK, I want to know how that what that's like, but I just love this idea of what do you know about being a doctor? It's only been a semester. 
at the end of every semester where you just kind of like, okay, okay, all right, I'm going to keep going? Or were you just like, I know this isn't right for me? Well, I was trying to be a dutiful child. And, you know, live up to familial obligations. This is not, this is going to be a familiar story to lots of people. And I didn't want to let them down and disappoint my family. But ultimately, I chose the Joseph Campbell thing of following my bliss. What was that like? What happened afterwards? (laughs) They didn't necessarily react particularly well at first. And it took some time. And even years after undergrad, My wonderful grandmother would say to me, you know, I heard about this girl. She's the granddaughter of a friend of a friend of mine, and she didn't wind up graduating pre-med. But then she took these other classes, and guess what? Now she's a doctor. Huh. And I'd be like, interesting story, Grandma. Thanks for telling me. (laughs) But eventually they came around, and they were incredibly supportive, and I'm very fortunate in that regard. Yes, absolutely. So what did you do then after you decided that? How did you pursue your art education or your art practice after that big momentous decision? So when I was 20 years old, I went to Italy. It was the summer before my senior year. And I sort of lucked my way into studying with Leonard Anderson at the International School of Art in Montecastello de Vivio. And he was really just profoundly inspiring to me. And that's when I got bitten by the observational painting bug, this desire to look at the motif and try to grasp it in some way and translate it on a two-dimensional surface, which is just such an incredibly addictive activity. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. So describe that. How did you look into that? What actually happened that you got to study with Leonard Anderson? I was going to go to study at a program in Florence. I was interested in applying for that. And instead, the head of the art department at Brandeis said, oh, don't go there, Ilana. They would just coddle you. They'll tell you everything you want to hear. Go to this other place in Monte Castello di Vivio. So I listened. And uh, that's where he, I met Leonard Anderson. He was teaching that summer. And I didn't realize sort of what a big deal he was at the time. All I knew is that he was this incredibly generous, kind, gentle teacher who would sit down and move some color spots about with his thumb, and suddenly magic happened. And I was just mesmerized, and I wanted to learn how to do that thing. What were some of your biggest takeaways from studying with him? What are the things that stuck with you today? Definitely empathy empathy for the motif, this idea that we have this constant chit chat happening in our heads and you have to sort of humble yourself in front of the motif and come at it with this idea of, I don't know you and I'm here to be receptive and learn about you and allow the motif to slowly reveal itself to you as opposed to trying to dictate your own terms to it, learning how to visually listen basically. So, so difficult to do. Very well put, very easy to say, and extraordinarily difficult to do. Oh, yes. It's just like a Zen practice. Yeah. I'm just trying to imagine where you were at that point where you just made this enormous decision and then you stumble into this program with Leonard Anderson and he drops that on you. That was a really big summer because I actually met Israel Hirschberg at the end of that summer. So it was like, he came at the end of that summer and he was checking out that place as a possible place to teach. And that was the first summer that he was there. And this was before he started his own program. And before he got there, there were three of his students who were there in that program in Italy with me. And I just felt like what they were doing was light years beyond what anybody else I saw. So of course I was like, uh, who are they studying with? Where are they studying? And I sat and I just tried to look at the way they handled the pains and everything. And it was all, everything was a revelation to me at that point. And so he came at the end of the summer and he gave a slide talk and I was really struck by his work. And I thought to myself, okay, how do I figure out a way to get out there and study with this person? And then you went to JSS, is that correct? Or no, had he not started that yet? 
<laughs> well, I finished uh, at Brandeis, and then I worked for a year. And after that year, I went out to Israel with Ari. Ari wound up doing his master's degree there, and I studied for two years in Israel Hirschberg's master class at the Jerusalem Studio School, and it was a really great experience. And I'm so glad that I did that before going to grad school because I feel like it really equipped me with perceptual skills and this whole idea of how do I make a painting, which is, you know, is in some places a very unfashionable thing to learn to do nowadays, although it's getting better out there. <laughs> We're seeing signs of life. <laughs> That's right. For people who have never seen your work, how would you describe it? You know, I don't have any one thing that I do. I sort of haven't been able to commit because I love too many different things. And I think that's uh, the balance in my life for meeting my husband, Ari, at age 18, getting engaged at age 19 and, uh, you know, committing very much in the romance department. So I can't commit in art. So <laughs> You already used up that ability with Ari. <laughs> exactly. All my commitment has been taken up. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't make you tell the story, but... Ilana and Ari have the most beautiful love story, meeting story I've ever heard. It's so adorable. Okay, not oh, going to make you, you tell it, but... People will have to hunt me down and find out for themselves. That's right. Um, but if I had to describe my work, um, I would say I'm an observational painter, meaning I look at something and then I respond to it. I would say my colors are pretty naturalistic. I work uh, in oil paint and then in charcoal and in grayscale pastel. And I love painting and drawing people and still lifes and landscapes. So like I said, I can't commit. I love it all. I want to jump forward a little bit. So you had this amazing background being able to study with all these great artists. And then you went on to grad school and brought all that with you. Can you talk a little bit about what happened after grad school? For example, this feeling I think that a lot of people have that you're in this very structured place and now all of a sudden you're out on your own. The bird has left the nest. What was that like for you? That was a really hard period in my life, I have to say. And there were a lot of factors that went into that. So I had been in grad school at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, which was a wonderful experience. I studied with a lot of great people there, but especially Scott Noel. I think he had the biggest influence on me. And then when I got out, I sort of got the adjunct job that I had been really hoping to get, which was adjuncting at Swarthmore College nearby. And that was a really good experience. I did that for several semesters. And at the same time, I had my first baby, Asher. And then I was pregnant with my second baby, Dina. And to the point where people at Swarthmore started asking what's in the water. <laughs> But at the same time, I had just lost my mother previous to entering grad school, right before grad school. And then immediately after grad school, when Asher was a little baby, eight months old, I lost my grandfather who had raised me like a father. He was basically my father. And I had, uh, I had my grandmother left, but that was it. And at that point, it was really wonderful that Ari and I met so early in life because I would have felt just utterly, utterly alone. And at the point when I was pregnant with Dina, and there we were in Philadelphia, I was adjuncting at Swarthmore and trying to produce my own work. And Ari got to the point of his PhD at Penn where he could sort of write it from anywhere. And we thought, we need some help. This is untenable. And uh, we went and we moved to Denver, Colorado where Ari grew up and where his family lived. And his parents were really, really helpful in terms of watching Asher, especially during the time that Dina was born. And so we got some great support then. But I felt sort of like I went into exile, like I had just recently graduated grad school. And it's at the point where you're supposed to launch into the world, right? Whatever that means. Right, right. But we have this idea anyway, and it's sort of like this kind of internal pressure that we give ourselves that, okay, I did all that work. And now it's time for me to take over the world. Now I'm a professional, whatever that means. Yes. And uh, instead, I was in a baby cave. And I had just uh, lost my family and felt like the world was crumbling around me and went into exile in a different state where I had never lived. 
and left my whole art community behind. They were somewhere else, and I was out in the wild frontier. <laughs> <laughs> with this whole new life. Yeah, with uh, a little creature inside of me and a little creature attached to me at all times. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, and now you're an artist. Congratulations. Look what life has brought you. <laughs> what are you going to do with all this? And you know what really I feel like? saved me in a way and reminded me who I was and kind of returned me to a feeling of, yes, I'm connected with this art journey that I'm on, which I felt very disconnected from as everything felt like it was crumbling around me. Actually, it was Jordan Wolfson. Have you had him on this program? No, not yet. So he was great. And he is great. He's uh, this painter in Boulder, Colorado, and heavily pregnant. I would drive up there uh, one day a week, and we would draw from the model together. And it was so grounding just to be able to reconnect with that experience of there's a figure in front of me, and I'm responding to this figure, and I'm drawing with charcoal or pastel. And for that period of time that I'm in there with the figure, I could focus on the figure and I could let everything else fall away around me. And no matter what else, I've been painting or working on in my life, I feel like being connected to working from the figure, whether it's an actual figure drawing or whether it's a portrait, it helps me remember who I am and it helps me remember what I'm doing. It's a big deal. It's a huge deal. And I'm just imagining that, especially during that time, some of the things that Leonard had told you about the empathy that you have with your subject and listening, learning how to both see and listen would be extraordinarily helpful in a situation like that, where you need to kind of calm your mind and just take this space for, for you. I think that arts and creating has a lot to do with your soul. And sometimes you need to feed that you need to give it oxygen <laughs> And it sounds like that's exactly what you needed. Absolutely. So the reason that I'm asking this is because I know from some of the letters that I get that there's some people that, you know, could be in a similar place where they're just feeling like so much happening in their lives, a lot of it not good, and they're trying to reconnect with their artwork. And when you're in that place, from hindsight, you know the other side of it. But when you're in it, it's a real struggle to see like, okay, how do I get myself out of this? How long does this last? And when is this going to be over? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious when, you know, when you're in that stage, if you just kind of felt like, okay, I'm just going to keep moving. You know, I've got this lifeline going and drawing with Jordan. How long did that last till you felt like Ilana again? Well, I was in Denver for two years. And so it was two years of me driving up there every week and drawing with Jordan. And whenever I was there, it was like, yes, this is my purpose. I'm remembering my purpose. Of course, none of us have any one purpose in life, but it was something that connected me to my artistic purpose anyway. And as far as what to tell people, I would say, remember that that period ends. All these cycles we have in life, they're cyclical and they end something else will come, a new day will dawn. And meanwhile, follow your own predilections, you know, follow your bliss. Paint the things that you want to paint, make the paintings you want to exist in the world, make the drawings you want to exist in the world, and trust that the process of that will somehow pull you to a different place. And it did for me. On the flip side of that, I would love to hear a time in your life that was kind of pivotal Basically, Ilana, I would love to hear you brag a little bit about some of the amazing things that have happened in your career and in your life. Oh, my goodness. All artists just love bragging, don't we? <laughs> I don't know. I think we like it better when other people brag for us. I think bragging for yeah. ourselves makes people squirm. <laughs> you probably see me squirming right now. <laughs> I do. And if somebody asked me that question, I would totally be squirming. I think I've been glad to be able to sort of have the chutzpah in my life when that chutzpah has been necessary. So at the very end of that time in Denver, actually, um, and this was before we knew what was going to come next, 
Ari was applying to jobs. He was just finishing up his PhD. And I could be an artist, of course, a painter without being attached to an institution. You can't really be a historian without being attached to an institution. So I, in a sense, had no power over where we were going to go next because we had to follow Ari's career, which that's what made sense. So then we really were wondering, so what happens if he bombs and nothing comes through, right? The disaster scenario. (laughs) Yeah. How long can we live in his parents' basement, right? (laughs) And so we wound up visiting the Bay Area because my best friend had just had a baby. And we were like, we don't know what's going on with our lives, but hey, baby, let's go to the Bay Area. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds good to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I took my portfolio with me because why not? Because may as well have it with me. And at that point, we were thinking if nothing comes through, we're going to move to the Bay Area, live in San Francisco and just hemorrhage money. And then eventually, I don't know what, wither away. We're trying to Something trying to will happen. Something will happen. That's faith. Yeah. That right there is yeah. faith. So we went out there on this trip. And I noticed that we were driving by an art school on our way to get to my friend's house. And it was the Academy of Art University. And I thought, well, maybe they need someone to teach art. And so I went in and there was uh, this very young man with a badge behind a desk. And I said, hi, I would really love to talk to somebody about possibly teaching painting and drawing. And he said, we don't do that. (laughs) What do you mean you don't do that? No, there's no one for you to talk to. You can't do that. I said, oh, okay. Can I see the painting and drawing facilities? I'd love to see what they look like. And he said, no, we don't do that. You can't do that. (laughs) And at this point, he's like, lady, go away. I can see that written all over his face. And I said, you mean you don't give tours? And he said, well, I mean, yeah, there are tours. And I said, oh, that's great. I would really love a tour. (laughs) <laughs> and so meanwhile Ari's in the car outside with our two sleeping infants I'm like Ari just give me a few minutes just give me a few minutes and so it turns out the next tour is starting right then I said that's fantastic that's really great timing okay sign me up and uh I went on the tour and I was the only person on the tour <laughs> oh my god that's so funny like wow lucky me (laughs) exactly and uh the lady who was giving the tour looked really annoyed and she said she had been planning to go get a cup of coffee but instead she had me to to give a tour to and so she did and I said well you know what don't worry about the whole tour I just want to see painting and drawing and uh she said okay (laughs) so she took me to see the painting and drawing which was in a different building altogether and There was a big portrait of a man with long hair, shoulder length hair. And I said, oh, who's that? And she said, oh, that's the director of the of the painting program. I said, oh, okay." And then we were walking through the area with the offices and he was standing in in an office and talking to someone because there were big glass windows I was able to see inside. And this whole story is just chutzpah central. Right. I'm just glad that nobody kicked me out. (laughs) So I said, hey, isn't that the man that was in the portrait just down the hall? And at this point, (laughs) she's feeling really nervous. (laughs) And she says, "Uh, yeah, but, you know, you probably shouldn't. And I was like, oh, but I just want to say hi. (laughs) (laughs) And then she's looking really uncomfortable. And I say, you know what? I could totally see myself out. You already showed me everything I want to see. Thank you. I'm good. (laughs) <laughs> and she was just so happy to get out of there. She did not want to be associated with me. I was going to bring down some sort of awful situation on her. So she got out of there really quickly. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This is so great. You can't write this. <laughs> and so I pop my head in and I say, oh, can I have a few minutes of your time? Excuse me. And he looks at me and he has no idea who I am, but he's you know very courteous. And he says, well, would you mind sitting on that couch over there until I'm done? And I said, oh, absolutely. I'll wait for you. I went and sat on the couch. A couple minutes later, he comes out and I say, well, I recently graduated from PAFA and uh, I'm interested if you have a teaching position here. And he immediately looked like he did not want to be there sitting on the couch with me. He (laughs) realized he was being cornered. Who likes being cornered, right? (laughs) Right. He thought he was going to get a new student. He's like, oh, man. (laughs) And then I said, and here's my portfolio. And I can see, like, I could feel him grinding his teeth, you know? (laughs) Right. (laughs) But he actually, you know, he felt the need to be polite. 
And uh, I'm very aware of the white privilege of this whole situation, you know, not getting the police called on me. I just want to say that Mm -hmm. (laughs) when you teach at an HBCU, you become aware of these things if you haven't already. So he looked at my work and then suddenly he started asking me, wait, where did you graduate from? Who did you study with? And so my work in that way, you know, opened the door for me. And I texted Ari shortly thereafter. And I said, I have two appointments set up with the head of illustration and the head of foundations. And he's like, what? (laughs) How did this happen? (laughs) It's like, you just left me here with the kids in the car for like five minutes. And now you've got a job. (laughs) It's 20 minutes later. What happened? (laughs) Exactly. Well, at least you weren't let out in handcuffs. That would have been a wholly different story. I'm sorry, but sometimes you have to take that crazy risk if you can, you know. And so I wound up getting a job. We didn't wind up moving there to the Bay Area. So I didn't wind up teaching in person because Ari got his postdoc. And that took us to Iowa City, actually, over the next two years. But I had this job teaching online. And so I didn't have to find a new teaching job every time we moved someplace. I was able to keep doing that. And that was uh, wound up being a really good experience for me. That is incredible. I had never heard that story. I know you taught there because we talked about that, but that is hilarious. And I'm actually not at all surprised. I mean, I am kind of surprised because I'm like, whoa, that is some chutzpah on a whole other level. But then I know you, so I'm not surprised. Well, sometimes you just got to think, what have I got to lose? Yeah, exactly. Incredible. That is so funny. So I want to switch gears a little bit. I would love to hear a little bit about your process and how you, let's start with how you select a motif. What is it that you look for when you're about to create something, whether that's a figurative piece or still life or landscape? Well, it depends on what it is, but it's formal things. I'm not really interested in a narrative when I start painting my painting. Really? A lot of times... Yeah, absolutely. Even though people always point out the narrative in my work. Well, I'm just thinking of a couple of your still lives. (laughs) Okay, go on. Well, that sort of starts to develop as things come together. So with my still lives, I always think about juxtapositions. And I always talk to my students about polarities and juxtapositions. And so I'm always trying to set up problems for myself. If the problems aren't complicated enough to the very verge of what I feel like I might or might not be able to solve, I don't think it's going to be an interesting painting or drawing. But if it's too complicated, it'll all fall apart and I'll never find that visual harmony that I need for it to hold together. So some of the polarities I work with, besides obviously light and dark, you know, sharp edges and and, uh, soft edges, all that kind of stuff, is the idea of intimate and the monumental. So since you mentioned my still lifes, Okay, yes. I like taking these objects that I inherited from my family and objects that I've picked up along the way and books because I like books. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. And arranging them in a way that makes it feel architectural. So that's more sort of purposefully arranged than landscapes or people because usually that like I see it and I know I want to paint that moment, that motif. So um, there's not as much arrangement involved, but the arrangement happens in the still lifes where I feel like I play and I move things around until I feel like they strike some sort of a balance for me. And these objects that are handheld and often very worn at the same time stand in for monuments in a way. So because this is a show for painters... We love talking about technique. (laughs) Happy to do it. Walk me through what happens once you've decided. Let's just, um, let's stay on still life since we started there. Once you've arranged your composition, what do you do? What happens? Well, it might still move while I'm painting if something doesn't feel right. But I take a sepia pencil and I draw directly onto the white canvas or the white panel. And I used to tint my canvases, especially when I was at the Jerusalem Studio School, to sort of a uh, lighter than middle, slightly warm tint. And that makes it much easier to find the values. But now I tend to think of my first layer as being my tinting of the canvas. You mean like a block-in? Yeah, like a block in, but it's pretty thin and it dries quickly at that point. So it's going to be pretty diluted. 
So I draw it out. And with the still lifes, I do a pretty involved drawing, which is really never the case with a landscape where I sort of just jump right in and start negotiating the shapes. But I feel the need because the still lifes are more more architectural like that. So I almost feel like I need to lay down some sort of an architectural drawing ahead of time, especially since there's going to be lettering oftentimes and things like that. So I do do a fairly involved drawing with a sepia pencil. And then I go in and dilute it with either turpentine or gamsol for the very first layer. And I try to aim for my best guesses in terms of color relationships. And I've sort of come to my own way of working that takes the approach taught at the Jerusalem Studio School and then the approach that was done more at PAFA and sort of ties them together. So I think the PAFA one is more common in terms of what you're going to find in art schools where I've heard it referred to as a newspaper approach. It's the all at once keeping things loose and open and trying to develop the whole painting at the same time. Okay, so now I know exactly what you're talking about, because I'm familiar with that and also a lot of the processes from JSS. But could you describe that for people listening who don't know? Well, so the newspaper approach is this idea that I'm not going to finish, finish is such a dirty word, isn't it? Any part of the painting while there are still other areas that need to be worked on. It's this idea of bringing everything to levels of resolution sort of at the same time. So that you're dealing, of course, with the large shapes and the large relationships, and you don't start to lose those in favor of details or locking something down prematurely. So the way I start tends to be that. My first layer will be that, and that's why I say it's my first best guess at the color. I don't expect it to be correct. And I've taken many, many years making friends with failure, (laughs) with not, with not nailing it the first time. Yes. It's okay. I'm going to do something and that's going to be wrong. And that's fantastic because that's going to give me something to react to. There you go. Yeah. It doesn't mean that I don't know what I'm doing or I'm a failed painter or all the things that start spinning inside of our heads. Absolutely. So the approach that I learned more at JSS was about starting in a certain area of interest, and it might be where the greatest value contrast is, but take three spots, this is that color spot approach, and try to get them right against each other until the three sit together in the correct visual harmony, in the relationships that you're actually observing in the motif. And then that becomes sort of your key on which the rest of the painting is based. And then the painting grows out like a stain from that point. So I start with that all over approach and then maybe at the second or the third pass, I'll just zoom in to an area of interest and I'll say, and now here we go. And then I'll work those three spots. It's like tuning a guitar or something. It's going back and forth until somehow it hits that sweet spot. And it's like, yes, that's a moment of perceptual truth right there. And then I'm able to flow out from that moment. I love it. And because I've seen you work now, it all makes sense. (laughs) Very, very cool. Because I interview so many different artists whose their styles, the way that they paint are so vastly different. I would say that your paintings have a calmness, a softness, kind of like a muted palette, but there's still a lot of color in there. So I'm curious if that comes from your own response to what you're seeing, or if that is an influence of some of the people that you've studied with? Because I think I feel like, you know, with Leonard Anderson, and a lot of the JSS school, it's a very beautifully soft, rich colors, but there's nothing like jarring in it ever. And it's always, to me, if I had to put it into a bucket, which I really hate doing, but just for the sake of conversation, it's understated. It's sort of like this, if I'm making this up right now, but if there was a philosophy, it was sort of like, I'm going to under promise and over deliver with my colors. Yeah, I think it comes, well, very much out of the JSS aesthetic. And then also Scott Noel, his colors are definitely very different from mine, but it's about finding colors within a very narrow 
tonal range and finding colors that are very close to each other where maybe one is you know barely different from the color next to it but just enough so so that there's a little hum i prefer personally and this is my aesthetic paintings that whisper rather than yell i don't want to yell i've always found that when people lower their voices and whisper you lean in and you want to hear what's going on and that's what i'm more compelled by that is so beautifully put i'm not even sure what to say next <laughs> It's just something that that I've noticed. And I'm always very reluctant to say something like that, that I don't like to put whole schools into buckets, even though, obviously, there's a thought process. And there are ideals that are being taught and spread. But what makes me reluctant is I don't like to say even though it is often true that you can tell somebody who went to PAFA, you can tell somebody who went to JSS. You know, in my case, it was the internet was just being born when I graduated from college. So the work that I saw was all Art Center and Art Center had a very particular look. And I get that that is sort of the lineage that we get, you know, you pick up the body language and mannerisms of your parents and of your, you know. (laughs) Well, I can talk about that a little bit, actually, because um, it sort of comes out of these two students of Charles Hawthorne, you know, Charles Hawthorne, whose teachings make up the book Hawthorne on Painting. And he had two students who were incredibly different but who both went on to influence generations and generations of painters. Edwin Dickinson, who was a tonalist, and Henry Henschey, who had much brighter colors. And you'll find that people that sort of come out of the Dickinson tradition, which I do, because Israel Hirschberg was very influenced by him, and Scott Noel, and many people who identify as perceptual painters uh, were very influenced by Dickinson. And it tends to be, although this is not true for everyone, tends to be a bit more tonal and less loud with color saturation. And then when you look at schools of painting that come directly out of Henry Henschey and Studio and Caminati, for example, is a great example of that. Uh, the colors tend to be brighter and bolder and air on the side of being more saturated rather than less saturated. So these two brothers and all the people they influenced. That's interesting. I, I wouldn't guess. I know that my studies have come more from the Henshi side. And I always attributed that, though, to California painters who, this is a complete stereotype, but I would say California painters tend to be more loud and brash with their colors. East Coast painters tend to be more muted. And I always just sort of attributed that to the light and the air and, you know, the geography of it. But now I'm curious, and I'm going to have to research it. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of truth to that also, definitely. And I'm some sort of a weird hybrid having grown up in California and then educated in the East Coast and Israel and Italy. And just, I'm some sort of weird chimera. Yeah, which is kind of what I feel like. Although, you know, I think I'm more on the loud, brash side and then have been introduced into the, the finer qualities of the subtleness And this all just makes me laugh because it just reminds me of just like culturally, I think it's so funny, both in the United States, East Coast, West Coast. But I'm also thinking about a conversation I had with one of my bosses who was from London. And he was just like, oh, my God, you Americans are so loud. I can hear you. I can hear you like two blocks away. (laughs) And I'd always be like, I'm sorry, what? I didn't hear you. (laughs) I remember that I was sitting at one point in the Jerusalem Studio School on a break, and one of the Israeli students, um, and you know, I'm Israeli, I was born there, but I grew up mostly in America, so I say one of the Israeli students, uh, came up to me and said, you sit like such an American. I was just thinking, well, what, what is that? How does one sit like an American? Yeah, how do we sit? I don't know, maybe like we own the place, we just spread out, we're, we're just so comfortable. I was just manspreading all over the place, I don't know. <laughs> That's probably accurate. (laughs) That's so funny. But it comes out in the painting, too. I think it really does like those cultural influences appear in the paintings, whether we like it or not. So there we go. It's part of our handwriting. 
it's amazing what people can see in your paintings that you had no intention of actually putting in there. You know, so much subconsciously just comes in. Yeah. Right now, I'm kind of wondering for people who are listening who are from the United States and not from the United States, what they would add to that conversation. I'm hearing my husband's voice in my head, and I think there will be a lot said about that whole thing. (laughs) I love being American, but let me tell you, I never feel more American than when I'm abroad. For sure. And right now we have, uh, for the last two months, my brother-in-law has been here visiting with us and it's making me feel more and more American for everything I do, like how I eat breakfast, when I eat breakfast. I'm like, boy, we're different. (laughs) And we smile a lot, all the time. Constantly. Yes. I think a Norwegian friend of mine was just like, oh my God, you guys are just happy about everything. And if you're happy about everything, when are you really happy? I'm like, good question. I don't know, but I'm happy. (laughs) Well, I'm happy to be here talking to you. (laughs) So are you a full professor now or adjunct? Well, full professor comes after you do assistant professor and then associate professor. And then the next stage, if somebody manages to reach that, is called full professor. So I'm in my first tenure track position right now, which means I'm an assistant professor of art. I'm already ready to promote you, Alana. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I want to hear about your experiences teaching in that environment. I'm just kind of curious if you see a pattern that's different than what you experienced, because I just feel like things are changing so quickly. And that, you know, for example, when we were in school, it was a whole other ball game versus now. What are you noticing about students who are coming through art school now? Well, I'm noticing that they want to learn skills. Students come in hungry. They want to know, how do you do that thing? Teach me. Teach me the specific things I need to know to do that thing. And uh, I'm happy to do that. And I don't know that that's so very different from what students wanted to know, you know, within the past 10 or 20 years, but especially at elite institutions and all the institutions that copied the elite institutions, they were taught that painting things that look like things is just not a valid thing to do. You could do almost anything but that. And they were sort of taught that that's not a sophisticated desire to have. And people were very concerned with being cool and sophisticated and seeming educated and all that sort of stuff. And you do that by learning that it's not appropriate to want to make things that look like things anymore. That period has come and passed. Right. But being here at Alabama State University, I don't have anybody telling me that I need to tell the students that they shouldn't have the desires that they have. And so instead, I I can be all like, you want to learn how to do that thing? Okay, come here, watch this. Okay, try this thing. So it's actually, I, I feel like I have a lot of freedom here. And that's really, really fun because I feel like I'm able to then be as helpful as I possibly can. What are some of the things that you see your students struggling with the most? Yeah, I'd say that that's pretty clear, actually. And it's the same thing I've seen students struggling with everywhere. Being okay with making mistakes and then making dramatic corrections. Because there's this idea, yeah, there's this idea that students have of after I've colored in all the white space, I'm done. And sometimes, you know, they'll go past that a little bit, but not that much. And I'll get a lot of pushback sometimes from students when I say, well, now that you've covered all the white space, that's when painting begins. So it's basically just really important to get them to acknowledge that mistakes are good. They're a starting point. If I didn't make mistakes, I wouldn't know where to go next. And then actually get in there, you know, have some elbow grease and do all the work that needs to get done. Don't be too soon made glad. Yes, I love that. The second part of it of not being afraid to make mistakes is liberating. I think it gives painters confidence. But the second part of what you said about then going in and making big, dramatic changes, I think oftentimes 
I see people who realize like, okay, fine, I got it. I made a mistake. Cool. I'm going to fix that in the same way that I built it, for example, as opposed to going in and making these big, giant changes. I think for me, one of the things that I still to this day, (laughs) because it's been so long now, that still resonates with me and I think about often is something Israel Hirschberg said, which was, don't be afraid to commit suicide in your paintings. And just this idea of going all in and not making little doodly changes to correct an error, but taking out an entire half of the painting if that's what you have to do. Absolutely. Don't sit around tickling it. (laughs) And yet, yeah, it's a huge lesson. And I think that is when we really start to paint. I love that. On the flip side of that, what do you enjoy seeing with your... I mean, I'm sure there's that's not like a... You don't enjoy seeing them do that and growing through those mistakes. But what do you enjoy seeing in your students? Discovery. I mean, isn't that what we're all in the teaching game for? When that light bulb goes on and suddenly you see them have that aha moment. That's the joy of teaching right there. That whole passing of the torch, I guess. Or lighting the flame, I think, is a better way to put it than passing the torch? Well, I've been very fortunate to have some really, really amazing people that I've learned from. And, you know, it's not just the work, but it's the person too who inspires you. You know, you want to see somebody living that life, that life committed to this crazy activity and making it work somehow. And I try to do that to my students. I try to make my love of responding to the motif hopefully be as infectious as my teacher's love of that was for me. This is going to be a difficult question to answer. Bring it Um, on. Bring it. Okay, let's get philosophical, Ilana. What do you think the role of art is in our world, especially today? I think Jordan Wolfson actually wrote a really neat essay about that, how art can save the world or how painting can save the world, something like that. Um, So if you want to hear a more in-depth answer, that might be a good thing for people to go and read. (laughs) You know, today, in our current state, we're presented with so much information, so many flickering images that we've become curators, that it's no longer issues of having access to information or images. It's about being able to tell the difference between what is worthy of your time and what isn't. And having this moment to just commune visually with the motif and be receptive to something and spend a good chunk of time maybe staring at another human being and responding to that, that's such a unique activity in this day and age when we're all totally plugged into the internet and everything like that and have images buzzing by our heads all the time. Yeah, and flipping through in like half a second and looking at and assessing a piece of a person or a piece of art in the time that it takes you to move your finger up this up your iPhone. John Berger wrote an essay on Degas where he churned Degas' name into a verb. Degas me, dear God, know me like that. It's the sense of quiet and profound knowing that we're searching after this deeper fulfillment that is lacking so often in our lives, especially nowadays. I think that's something that painting, whether you're in the act itself or you're appreciating an art object, that's something that the painting provides. Absolutely. And especially, like you said, with models, it's such an intimate experience to look at someone and be looked at for that long. If you do that in, you know, real life, you probably will have the police called on you. (laughs) But in an art context, it's okay to be a total creep and stare like that. Yeah, it's just be like really staring at people. It's been a while since I've painted the figure, but I became so accustomed to staring at people like that, that I would catch myself doing it in restaurants, not meaning to, or, you know, I just all of a sudden realized like, whoa, I'm really staring at that person and probably creeping them out. Yes. Mirrored sunglasses are the best thing in the world if you're sketching in public. (laughs) I haven't tried that. They can't see your eyes. So you can kind of just, you know, position your head so that you can look up and down without moving your head dramatically without doing the continual head nod. 
And you can sit in Starbucks at airports at the DMV for hours. <laughs> so mirrored sunglasses will make me appear less creepy. Check. How about a trench coat? Will that help as well? A trench coat, a fedora. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> that will just complete the picture and nobody will say anything. Good. Now I know. I have two more questions for you. If you could talk to the Ilana of, let's say, 10, 15 years ago, let's just give it a date, the Ilana in the year 2000. What would you say? First of all, it's okay to be a painter. It's okay. It's really okay. Enjoy it. Own it. But also, secondarily, don't be afraid of painting something you find beautiful. Because that's a hang-up I had for a good long time because I was afraid of getting overly sentimental. I was afraid of getting too emotional in my paintings or something like that, or just pretty, you know, pretty and beautiful. They've become dirty words. And I think my fear of that led me to avoid making the paintings that maybe I should have been making at that point. You know what, there's that part of me that's the dramatic Russian. I'm really emotional. I'm an emotional person and I should just embrace that even though sometimes the emotions can be very quiet, but boy, are they there. And I wish I would have given myself permission in the way that I have in more recent years to just go after that thing that you find beautiful and stop making it so complicated. Excellent. I love it. And... I'm curious if there is a painting that you've done that you would never, ever give away or sell or let out of your life. Well, the painting that I would have said that about was stolen. So I don't actually have that painting anymore. But who knows, maybe someday it will find its way back to me. Right? You believe in miracles? (laughs) It was a painting I did of my grandfather during my second year at the Jerusalem Studio School. And I'm just glad that I took good photos of it. So I still have those, even though obviously seeing a photo is not anything near the same as seeing an art object in real life. But it was right after my mom died and he and my grandmother came out to visit me in Israel. And it was done completely from life in three sittings in his brother's house in Ashdod. And it was one of those paintings that's just a gift. Like you don't even work for it. It was way ahead of anything else that I was painting at that time. And I remember Israel noticed that at the time. He's like, oh, where'd that come from? And uh, there is this wonderful painter that has his own art school in Tel Aviv right now named Aram Gershuni. And he was older than I was and more experienced. And uh, I admired his work very much. And he came to me and he said, hey, you want to trade for that painting? I was thinking to myself, oh my gosh, he wants to trade with me. That is amazing. Yes, I want one of his paintings, but I can't part with that painting. I just can't. And of course, now, of course, I wish I had, because then he would have that painting and I would have an Aram Gershuni painting. (laughs) But it was not meant to be. So perhaps one day, and this is actually uh, one of the images that I sent to you, Antri, so you can put it up so people can see what I'm talking about. But to me, that painting was one of those moments of grace. You know, now I guess that level of painting is not so unfamiliar to me, but at the time, it really just came out of nowhere. Those are the ones that just make it all come together, and that gets you right here in the heart. Ilana, it has been so fun talking to you and catching up with you. Thank you so much for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. It's been a real pleasure for me too, and Trees. Thank you so much for having me on your show. You can see Ilana's work at ilanahagler.com and in the show notes for this episode. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the podcast tab. You'll find show notes there with links to all of the artists that we talked about, plus links to connect with Ilana. And you'll get to see some of her paintings, including the one of her grandfather that she mentioned. And now for a moment of gratitude. The Savvy Painter podcast is made possible in large part by listeners like you. 
If you'd like to help out, it's quick and easy, and it's a humongous help to the show. I really appreciate it. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash support. And with that, I have some very, very special people to thank. Without these people, this podcast would not exist at all. So a huge thank you to Teresa Manning, Jennifer Lessman, Ruth Kalb, Carolyn Green, Lois McCarthy, David Gorski. Thanks so much for your note, David. I did get it. Diane McGee, Kirsten Johnson, Susan Zefting Kuhn, Teresa Hill, Martin Scherer, Alchemy Works, Deb Cook Shapiro, Denise Klitzy, Kate Weinstein, Corin Salchka, Pat Oxley, Lucinda Kasser, Jill Opelka, Kathleen Speranza, Sally Taylor, ZB Gallery, Mr. Andy Doby, and Wright Design. Thank you so much for your support of the podcast. So until the next time, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.